Um, I think this is incredibly valuable, what you just shared with us. Um, because uh, from the outside, um, we tend to look at thing as, things as uh, in a stereotypical fashion. Um, but part of the process of meeting someone like you is to try to understand the personal experience and the uh, values vision process from where you happen to stand uh, in this very unique time. And this is the fourth group I brought to South Africa. We are spending time in the first world here, but we're also spending time. We were in uh, Langa yesterday. Oh, great. Uh, we'll be in Kailecha today. We'll be in Soweto. Uh, we'll be in Tembisa. Um, and we'll be visiting the uh, Children's AIDS Project, uh, the Bachabella Children's AIDS Project, Fantastic. where we're bringing clothing and medicine and equipment uh, to try to uh, give people who are already doing the work some support for the valuable work that they're doing. So we're not sort of the normal um, group. That's so, great. You do, you're, doing, you're doing a lot better than many, most uh, white South Africans of your age. <laughs> um, hi, my name is Cleo. I was wondering if you could talk about some of the interesting turning point, or some of the significant turning points on your journey to becoming Chief of Staff of President de Klerk. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I have never really been ambitious in terms of saying, well, look, I want that job. I'm really going to work for that job. My approach throughout all of my career was to be very interested in what I was doing and to do it as best I could, to make a lot of friends, not to make enemies, and to be very flexible. That is, to be able to take advantage of any opportunity that came along. And I, I found that uh, that uh, by following that, that approach, things happen uh, that you don't expect. I, at, at the relatively, well, the very early age of 37, I was made the South African ambassador at the United Nations. Uh, I was very embarrassed. I thought I was too young. But then I, I kind of got to like it. <laughs> And, and uh, uh, then, uh, again, uh, at, uh, at a relatively young age, I was asked to take over the communication role, the internal communication role for the South African government under President P.W. Wurter. It's not, not nothing that I expected, but it happened, and it was very, very difficult, as you can imagine, during the 1980s. And then, uh, to my great surprise, in... 1992, President de Klerk asked me to be the, his chief of staff, the director general in his office. So I guess those were all important uh, turning points. My experience at the United Nations was, uh, I suppose, the, one of the life-changing situations. Being the South African ambassador at the United Nations was a, a sort of a very interesting situation at the beginning of the 1980s because we were the most unpopular country in the world. Uh, the Israelis limped in a sort of very weak second with, with the Chileans, Chileans coming down the road a little bit. <laughs> but South Africa was, uh, was really the most unpopular country in the world. And uh, it, 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 it is in fact a very interesting situation to be in, to be an unpopular individual in a group. Because it means that you really have to go through a whole lot of introspection. <laughs> You've got to say, are, are we really as bad as, as the world says we are? And I think it was clear that, that in many respects we were. Uh, there were things that were happening in South Africa that were indefensible. But were we aware of this and were we trying to change? And the answer was yes. Uh, from the end of the 1970s, we started with a, a really significant process of reform. But uh, that was under President P.W. Buerta. But President P.W. Buerta, I suspect, had not read de Tocqueville 
and did not understand that revolutions take place in situations of rising expectations and not in situations of repression. So <clears throat> I then also looked at the at some of our accusers and uh, were we as bad as the Bulgarians? No, I didn't think so. In fact, uh, in 1976, the, the uh, UN adopted international convention against apartheid. But it transpires that of the 31 signatories, original signatories to the treaty, 27, according to Freedom House, had worse human rights records than South Africa. <laughs> because it was, by and large, a, uh, an initiative of the Soviet Union. And in, the, in its sort of geopolitical struggle against the United States and the West in those days. So, uh, being the most unpopular uh, individual in a community makes you acutely aware of uh, the shortcomings of your own society and of the need to support genuine solutions to those problems. But it also makes you aware of the enormous hypocrisy uh, of uh, international discourse. Uh, the, uh, <laughs> it is, uh, in many respects, uh, going across the road, uh, First Avenue into the United Nations was like uh, falling down the rabbit hole in Alice in Wonderland. Because suddenly you, you arrived plop in the delegates' lounge where words no longer had meaning <laughs> and actions no longer had consequences. <laughs> it was crazy. Uh, so you, wh when I was there, uh, at the height of the Iran hostage crisis, the, one of the Western countries decided to launch an initiative for an international convention against hostage taking. And so they, the General Assembly appointed a drafting committee. And one of the countries on the drafting committee was Iran. <laughs> and the West Germans uh, proposed an international treaty against terrorism. And by the time it had gone through the General Assembly mill, it was International Convention Against Terrorism and the manifest uh, injustices which cause some people to take desperate action. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it was, uh, uh, it, it, uh, in a way, uh, it <clears throat> strengthened my belief in a divine plan for the universe because my view was that a universe quite so exquisitely ironic could not happen by accident. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, that was a, that was a very interesting experience. And then, uh, trying to communicate on behalf of the South African government, on behalf of P.W. Buerta, was also interesting. He was, a, he was a reformer, he was a very powerful man, but like many powerful men, didn't listen terribly well. Uh, one of the things that we initiated in the communication agency that I started, in which I just for fun, decided to run on business lines, which sent shivers of horror through all of my bureaucratic colleagues, it was to institute really, really uh, widespread uh, opinion surveys among South Africans of all races. And we did door-to-door uh, -door surveys with uh, black South Africans, coloreds, Indians, whites, big samples. And from 1986 onward, they told us that the support of the ANC was between 60 and 63 percent. That the support of the National Party was around 20, 22 percent. Uh, support of the IFP was around 10 percent, 11 percent. Almost exactly the figures that emerged from the, the 1994 election. But we briefed the government on this. We said, look, these are the realities. And I think it was very, very important for the, the government to understand what the realities were in the country. Because there was a tendency to think, oh, well, no, those are just rabble-rousers. They don't really represent uh, 
uh, popular opinion. And I think that was one of the factors that, that may have contributed to uh, the huge process of reassessment that took place within the National Party leadership toward the end of the 1980s. Uh, becoming uh, the Director General in the office of the President was, uh, uh, you know, really uh, very uh, exciting. Uh, at a time of such critical importance in our national history to be able to play a role, and that was, uh, was an enormous privilege to be able to work with people like Nelson Mandela was, uh, you know, uh, an historic honor. Uh, and then to see again how the mechanics of the situation worked uh, at that time of great, great change throughout the world and how the events in Russia, the Soviet Union, and in Central Europe had such a direct impact on what happened in South Africa and to, to meet and to interact with so many of the people who were involved in that huge historic change process was a, a great uh, experience. Hi, um, I'm Elise. And we're really wondering, how did the clerk, with your support, go about building the necessary consensus to make the difficult and controversial decisions that ended apartheid? When de Klerk was elected leader of the National Party, uh, there was a lot of pressure building up within the caucus of the ruling National Party for change. Uh, the previous uh, President, P.W. Buerta, had understood the need for reform and had instituted many of the, many very fundamental reforms that had already got rid of most of the more obnoxious elements of apartheid. Uh, but he did not want to surrender white sovereignty. So, so uh, he could take, he could go to Mount Nebo, like Moses, but he couldn't cross the Jordan River into the promised land. <laughs> that took somebody from a different generation. And uh, that somebody was F.W. de Klerk. And we, he, de Klerk realized how, how much pressure had been building up within the caucus for real change uh, when he was elected. Uh, timing is interesting. Uh, he was elected leader of the National Party exactly a year to the hour before he made his historic speech in Parliament. It was at 11 o'clock on, on the morning of the 2nd of February 1989. And he won, uh, what happened was quite remarkably, uh, the, na the National Party caucus, out of the blue, without any warning, received a letter from President Buerto, who had suffered a stroke a month or so earlier, which he said he was resigning as leader of the National Party. He was going to stay on as president uh, to play a role in negotiations but he was resigning as a leader of the National Party. So there and then they decided that rather than have a bruising uh, leadership contest over a number of weeks, they would vote then and there for a new leader. And de Klerk won only by nine votes, eight votes, over the more liberal candidate. So it was a clear indication of the pressure building up for real change. And then uh, the other factor, there were, there were uh, other very, very important factors that, that facilitated the decision of the 2nd of February 1990. One of them was the, the fact that there had been huge socio-economic changes in South Africa during the 80s. Uh, in 1970, the black share of income in the country was only about 21%. White share was 72%. But between 1970 and 1994, there were enormous shifts as people came into the cities and became involved in the economy. By 1994, the white share was down to 50%. 
the black colored and Asian share was up to uh, the other 50%. So that meant people were moving into the economy at higher and higher levels. Uh, it was impossible to run the South African economy on the, the basis of white skills. So we had more and more uh, black uh, uh, South Africans working as bank tellers or whatever it may be in white collar jobs doing exactly the same work as their white colleagues. There's no way that they were going to go to segregated dining rooms or segregated enter places of entertainment. Uh, to a very large extent, uh, what was happening was that economic forces were changing South Africa. The government was coming along after the event, passing legislation to give recognition to what was already happening. Uh, huge changes are taking place in the white community. In 1948, when, uh, when the National Party came to power, the vast majority of its support base were in that second tier. They were blue-collar workers or small farmers. But between 1948 and 1990 or 1988, a whole generation of Afrikaners moved into the middle class. They went to university, they started to travel, and as they were exposed to different ways of looking at things. And as a result of that, they became increasingly uncomfortable with apartheid. And this also started to, to develop pressures for change, for some kind of reasonable accommodation. Another very important one was that by 1988, all of the parties to the conflict had accepted that there could not be a military outcome. There could neither be a revolutionary success nor a, 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 a continuous repression by security forces. That the only way out was negotiation. It was Nelson Mandela, who in 1987 was one of the first people, leaders to recognize this and to open a line of communication with the South African government. The other huge development was, of course, the uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union and the, the independence of Namibia. Uh, the, we were very worried about, about the influence of the South African Communist Party on the ANC. Throughout the 70s and 80s, virtually all of the members of the ANC's National Executive Committee were also members of the South African Communist Party. The ANC's armed wing in Mkonto Wisizwe was under the control of the South African Communist Party. So when I was ambassador at the United Nations, I was, this I took very seriously. Uh, it's one thing to have a one man, one vote election that leads to a genuine democracy. It's another thing if it's seen as a route to communist dictatorship. So the Soviet Union invested a lot of time and effort in surrogate wars in Southern Africa, the most notable of which was on the border between Namibia and Angola. And in October 1987, uh, the Angolan forces, led by and supported by Russians and Cubans, decided on having one major thrust, final major thrust, to eliminate UNITA from uh, the picture, UNITA was an anti-government uh, guerrilla movement in Angola from the picture so that they would be able to uh, move more concertedly toward the Namibian border. And our armed forces plus UNITA inflicted an absolutely crushing defeat on them. We, we, uh, they lost a whole brigade, which is about five or 6,000 men, 94 tanks. Uh, about 20 aircraft. Uh, so it was one of the biggest set piece battles in, in Africa since the Second World War. And that, I think, broke the, the willingness of the Russians to continue. Already things were get, beginning to fall to pieces. Uh, in Russia, in the Soviet Union, it was Glashnost, Perestroika. And I think the Russians said, OK, that's it. You've had your shot at a military outcome. It didn't work. So now you guys have got to reach an agreement with the South Africans on the withdrawal of Cuban forces from Angola. And that happened in 1988. And until then, the condition for the independence of Namibia, which was accepted also by the United States, was the withdrawal of Cuban forces from Angola. 
And that was achieved in an agreement between Cuba, Angola, and South Africa in 1988. And it opened the way to the relatively successful independence of Namibia, but not a revolutionary process as, as the Soviet Union had wanted, but under a proper constitution with proper guarantees for minorities, uh, with uh, genuine elections. And that's what happened in 1989 in Namibia. And it, it was in many respects a dry run for South Africa. And because it happened successfully, and it's, Namibia is still a functioning democracy, so it worked. It wouldn't have worked had there been a revolutionary outcome. So that, that was another green traffic light. So you had all of these green traffic lights turning green at the right time and, and creating this enormous window of opportunity at the beginning of 1990. And de Klerk realized that the, what, they, what they call the balance of forces would never again be so propitious for a proper negotiated outcome. So it's quite a long answer, but there you go. Yeah. Hi, I'm Cece. What can you tell us about the character of President de Klerk that allowed him to stand up to the pressures that were present during those transitional years? He's a, a very un, unusual kind of politician um, uh, because he's actually a, a bit of a softy. <laughs> and he's actually qu quite a nice guy. <laughs> Most politicians aren't. <laughs> <laughs> Politicians are very, very strange piece, beasts. I was never a politician myself. But they all have this incredible vision about their own destinies. You know, if you, as they say, if you stand for dog catcher, you're actually thinking of standing for presidency. <laughs> so they're an odd type of people. But in de Klerk's case, uh, I think it was... Uh, the fact that he was a very astute politician. He'd managed to position himself in the center of the National Party. So he was able to take advantage of the situation as it developed. The other factor, I think, was uh, his uh, religious background. Uh, he belonged to uh, the smallest of the Afrikaans reformed churches. But the, the one that was perhaps uh, the most consistent in terms of Calvinist doctrine. And that was that, uh, you know, if you decide that something is wrong, you, you actually have to live it out. <laughs> you actually got to take it to the end of the road in the logical conclusion. And I think that that was a very big uh, and important factor. The, the largest factor, faction in the Dutch Reformed Church are much more worldly and more inclined to compromise. But if, if you're a member of this very small church, uh, the, the doctrinal uh, position was very clear, uh, very simple. If something's wrong, you've got to finish it. Uh, the, you, you can't compromise on that. I think that was a factor. I think another factor that enabled him to deal with all of this is that unlike his predecessor, he was uh, a, a listener. His predecessor, P.W. Boerte, ruled uh, to a large extent by fear. Uh, everybody would, uh, who was gathered around the cabinet or whatever it was, State Security Council meeting, would look very carefully for cues from the president as to whether they should continue with a line of reasoning. They would say, well, president, uh, uh, do you think we should do X, Y, and Z? And if he sort of nodded, they would go further along. If he looked negative, they would immediately <laughs> pull back. Now, that's not a, and don't think this doesn't happen in a lot of corporate boards and a lot of power situations and in, you know, throughout societies. Uh, you have some leaders who really are bullies and it's not a good leadership style. De Klerk, on the other hand, uh, really encouraged his cabinet and his caucus to express their views. And he would sum up the consensus. And I think it was the fact that he listened uh, and that he made 
his uh, colleagues very much part of the decision-making process that enabled him to go through this whole very rocky process uh, without any cracks in his cabinet or in his caucus. He had solid support throughout. Nobody left. So I think those were some of the characteristics that, uh, that helped him. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. All right, so um, I'm Tyler, and can you talk about your role as events were unfolding? Yeah, um, I, I had a really, really interesting uh, career, and the thing that I found uh, was that, uh, and I think throughout my career, that whenever I have made mistakes, it was because I didn't speak up and say what I thought was right. I didn't believe in myself. Uh, that uh, so many of us know what the right course is, but we think, well, who are we? Who am I to make this suggestion? All of these very big and powerful people are uh, saying the opposite. And uh, I was uh, a junior member of the not even a member of the working committee of the State Security Council in the early 80s, representing the Director General of Foreign Affairs. I was a diplomat at that time. And these guys started talking about moving black people out of Kailitsha. And this was a big plan. They, they had already mobilized the trucks with Zulu-speaking South Africans to come down to do these removals. And I thought, geez, this, this, is, this will be a catastrophe. And uh, a, another of my colleagues, a, a very junior guy, well, not a relatively junior guy from the presidency, agreed with me. And so I said, look, I'm going to speak to my guy. You speak to your guy <laughs> and tell them that this can't happen. And uh, he did. He spoke to President Buerta, and I spoke to the foreign minister, Puck Buerta. And I said, look, you know, if, this, if this happens, it will be a catastrophe. Uh, you know, so fortunately, uh, the you know, wiser council prevailed, and they stopped. The trucks turned around. So th the point here is that, is that even at a relatively junior level. If you see something wrong, you've got to say that it's wrong, and you've got to try and do something about it. Uh, <clears throat> at other stages in, in my career, well, I, I was, uh, I was the, the spin doctor. I was the spin doctor for de Klerk, advising him on communication. And communication is really, really a core element of any government. And we had numerous, numerous communication crises. And, and I had a very, very simple process of advice for the president when there was a crisis. Because strangely enough, presidents are often the last people to know what's going on. Because they have whole ranks of bureaucrats and ministers who filter reality and truth from them. Nobody wants to tell the boss a bad, the bad news, you know? So they all give him a doctored version of what's happening. And so crisis arises. We find that, uh, that the defense force has been aiding the IFP uh, against the president's specific instructions uh, with all sorts of secret projects. So the, f the rules that we followed were that, first of all, rule number one, Find out the hell, what's going on. The second rule is to take the communication initiative. If you find out what's going on, you don't wait for it to break in the papers. You take the initiative. You, you hold a press conference and you say, look, this has been happening. The third thing is you take real and credible counteraction. And you say, look, this is what we're doing to address the problem. The fourth one, which is basic, don't cover anything up. Tell, put it all on the table. Because 
one of the golden rules is that if you don't, somebody will pull it out. And the problem is nearly always the cover-up, not, not the problem. <laughs> so we followed this advice uh, on numerous occasions, and it, it worked. That you find out what's going on, you then take the communication initiative, you don't cover up, and you take credible counteraction. So uh, that was maybe my contribution during the process. I also had the job of, uh, you know, summing up the discussions that were taking place and issuing the press statement, <laughs> which, uh, which can be quite, Im quite important in these circumstances. Uh, yeah, those. Yeah, I think those were those were perhaps the main, the main moments that I remember. Hi, I'm Sophie. I wanted to know if you were always aligned with what was going on or decisions made during those critical times of transition. No, I I, I was a public servant, so my view was that I served the government of the day, and if I I couldn't serve the government of day, good conscience, I should re resign. But that doesn't mean that you support everything that the government does. Uh, when I was a diplomat, I saw my, my task as explaining the situation, uh, explaining what the government's views were, explaining what the, uh, the circumstances were which had created whatever situation had arisen. Uh, as a diplomat, you should never become an advocate. Uh, you're, as a diplomat and as any kind of communicator, your value is determined entirely by your credibility. Uh, if you lie, then you lose your credibility and you lose your value completely as a communicator. <coughs> so you never tell a discernible lie. <laughs> 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 and there are important differences. I, I had a very difficult situation on the 24th of May, 1985. I remember it well because it was the day after my 40th birthday. And unfortunately, I'd had a very big party. And I'd got to bed at about 4 o'clock, and I was frankly seriously hungover. <laughs> and I'd had a party the e pre previous evening where my good friends from the British and American embassies were present. And uh, then I, when I arrived at the office, I was, I was confronted with a huge crisis because the Angolans had caught South African special forces outside of the Gulf oil installation in Cabinda in Angola. And it looked to everybody as though they were there to blow them up. And uh, our defense force was uh, pumping out a story that, oh, no, no, these guys were just a, a reconnaissance group. They were on their way through the jungle to a reconnoiter, a Swapo base in southern Cabinda. And, uh, <coughs> This didn't have any credibility. And I went with the Director General of Foreign Affairs to see the head of our Defence Force, who was a guy called Constant Villun. And uh, we said, look, we have a crisis. Uh, can you tell us what's going on? And he told us this story. And I, I wasn't very senior. I had about the rank of a colonel, and he was the head of the army, the Defence Force. And so in my very hungover state, I said, I asked him, said, General, are you telling us the truth? <laughs> and, and his eyes twinkled. He said, oh, 75%? <laughs> <laughs> and then I had the problem of, of, of briefing my colleagues, who were also my friends from the American and British embassies. They came to see me and they, they said, Dave, what's going on? 
And here you can't, you can't compromise your credibility. So I said, look, uh, Tim, um, you know about the situation that arose. At 9.20 this morning, the Director General of Foreign Affairs, and I went to see the head of the South African Defense Force, and this is what he said, and I quote. <laughs> <laughs> And he knew exactly what I was saying. <laughs> so so the, it comes down to the situation that, that if you're a communicator, you've got to retain your credibility, and that goes throughout life. Yeah. Um, so my name is Max, mm -hmm. and earlier on you were discussing speaking on behalf of the president. So on that note, in an interview with Dr. Onslow, you said with a certain level of humor. One of the things I subsequently learned was that if you communicate badly on behalf of others, they will forgive you. But if you communicate well on their behalf, they will never forgive you. <laughs> That's very <really> true. <laughs> Can you tell us a little more about that? Well, yes. Uh, the, it, it, it arose when I was responsible for the communication function. And this is a, a minefield because uh, you are, if you have a central communication role, you are inevitably going to be communicating on the terrain of other government departments and potentates. And the, the rule is that if you do this badly, they will forgive you. But if you communicate better than they would, they will never forgive you. <laughs> because you are actually taking over their line function responsibility. You cannot separate responsibility from commu for communicating with responsibility for running the function. So I, what I did was I repositioned the communication agency, not as the generator of any, any messages, but as the provider of central communication services to make sure that, uh, that if ministers communicated, they did so as effectively as possible. Uh, so we had really good uh, research, communication research people, market research people. We, I could put together very good advertising campaigns, but we didn't, we purposefully didn't generate messages. Because as soon as you do that, you step on the toes of, of your colleagues and they will never forgive you. <laughs> <coughs> Hello, I'm Sophia. Uh, were there any memorable experiences that you can recount from your interactions with Nelson Mandela? Uh, yes, indeed. Uh, I recall uh, very soon after the transition, uh, around the 11th, 12th of May, 1994, it was my honor to take Nelson Mandela to look at the various residences that he might uh, occupy in his new capacity as president. and. Uh, I took him to the venerable old mansion that had served as the residence of previous governors, general and presidents of South Africa. And he was with Barbara Masekela and one of his grandchildren. And it was really an experience to walk with this historic figure, very humble man, <coughs> to these buildings that had been the headquarters of his enemies for so many generations and to see his see how completely unimpressed he was by, by it all he was a, he was a, a really quite a remarkable man and i suppose the other thing that i remember is that when i when i turned 50 I suddenly a, i got a phone call and it was mandela who was then president he said dave Oh, you are now 50. Uh, you are now a real man. <laughs> Congratulations. I, I, uh, I always had the, an enormous amount of respect and affection for him, but he could be a very, very bruising and brutal politician. The idea of Nelson Mandela as, you know, Saint Nelson is the first idea that he himself would have dis dismissed. Uh, but uh, quite a remarkable man, and uh, perhaps the most impressive politician I've met. Hello, I'm Nathan, and can you talk about the decision to prepare for free elections in such a short time, 
and the tension that must have arisen from that? <coughs> well, it wasn't really such a short time. Uh, you know, we had uh, we adopted our uh, interim constitution uh, in December 1993. The elections were on the 27th of April, so we had a few months. And, and <coughs> there had been a lot of preliminary discussion, be, even before the adoption of, of the interim constitution on how the elections would be run. For example, we had a transitional executive committee that would oversee all of these actions in the interim. So there was an independent electoral commission that was established immediately uh, that was acceptable to all of the parties involved in the elections. Uh, the existing structures of the Department of Home Affairs were put at its disposal. The elections were run by, by Judge Kriegler, who subsequently became a member of our constitutional court. Uh, to be frank, they were pretty chaotic. Uh, the outcome uh, we described as being an election of the Impressionist school. <laughs> <laughs> not the super-realism school, but <laughs> close enough for everybody to recognize the broad features <laughs> and acceptable for, for most people. Where <coughs> the National Party thinks they got perhaps a million more votes than they did, but then so, so does everybody else. <laughs> Hi, my name is mm -hmm. Sonia. Mm -hmm. Was there someone who inspired or mentored you your, your, in your career? Uh, I guess Adam Smith. <laughs> uh, yeah, I no 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 real individuals. Maybe my father uh, was a, was a guiding spirit, but our views diverged after a while. Uh, but and, and I and I had some. <coughs> people who were in senior positions who helped me when I was in the Department of Foreign Affairs. But on the whole, uh, I guess I looked for my role models in history. <laughs> Hi, I'm Lily. Uh, we noted in that same interview with Dr. Anzo that you were witness to the careers of many prominent people in the diplomatic and political arena. Can you tell us from your observations what helps people advance in their careers and what causes them to fail? Yeah, I think I've mentioned the, the, the factors that I believe are, are critical, and, and they are uh, really three things. You've got to be able to do whatever you do really well. You've got to be able to deliver, wh whether it's a service or whatever product. It, the academic qualifications mean nothing. <laughs> they might help you to, uh, you know, with some background, but you have to be able to deliver. The second thing is you have to have good interpersonal relations. Uh, you, you have some really brilliant people who alienate uh, powerful idiots, which, uh, you know, is most people can, are uh, surrounded by a powerful idiots, so you, you can't do that. <laughs> so you've got, to have, you've got to have good interpersonal relations. And then the third thing is you've got to be really, really flexible. And that is you must be really aware of what's going on around you. You've got to be aware of all of the opportunities and threats that confront you. And you've got to be able to move very quickly and decisively to take advantage of an opportunity or to avoid a threat. And in my career, I, I saw that most people weren't even aware of the opportunities that were falling around them like ripe fruit. <laughs> they just went through life, blah, blah, premature foreclosure, you know. <laughs> this, this is the way I've always done it, this is the way I'm going to do it. So you have to, uh, you have to be really, really, really flexible in a, in, a, in a period, particularly in a world that is changing as rapidly and as, <clears throat> as dramatically as ours. There's simply no room for uh, those who are dozing and who think they can continue to do things the way they've always done them. And the interesting thing is that, uh, that these 
or the survival factors in nature as well. If you're an impala, you've got to be really good at what you do, which is running. <laughs> <laughs> you've got to be really in touch with the herd. It's the, elk, the guy who's a straggler, who's not with the herd, who gets taken by the lion. You know, you've got to be watching the, the herd very carefully and but I have good relations with the herd. And then the, the, the third thing is you've got to be really aware of your environment. It, that rustle in the grass <laughs> might be the lion. <laughs> and you've got to be able to move very, very quickly <laughs> in order to take advantage of an opportunity or avoid a threat. Words to live by. Hello, I'm Holden. Uh, given a long and successful career, it seems that you could have retired but you're still working with the Declare Foundation. Is there something in particular that you want to accomplish that keeps you motivated? Yeah, there is, I'm afraid, and that is defending our Constitution. Uh, the, uh, the product of, uh, of F.W. de Klerk's presidency was the final Constitution. When, when he handed over power on the 10th of May, 1994, he didn't hand power to Nelson Mandela, to the ANC, he handed it to a new constitutional dispensation. The government of the day is the guardian of that dispensation. But the future happiness, prosperity of everybody in this country depends on our ability to abide by the fundamental values that the constitution articulates. And they're very simple. They're in section one of our constitution and the values are human dignity, the achievement of equality, the advancement of human rights and freedoms, non-racialism, non-sexism, the supremacy of the constitution and the rule of law, and a genuine multi-party democratic system with regular elections that is open, accountable, and responsive. And that is our mission statement as a country. So for me, the, the uh, prospect of continuing to work for that is a huge motivation. And it's under threat. It's under enormous threat right now. Uh, ironically, uh, from a number of different quarters, but we are really, really worried about some of the rights in that constitution now. Hello, I'm Julia. Um, on our first day in South Africa, it was Youth Day. Since you have done so much for your with your life for the country, what is it you would like to ask of our generation? Well, I think in, in, for if the, if the question is put to South African youth, I would say get an education however you can. Uh, Get a job, however you can. Um, make a life for yourself. Uh, accept your responsibilities as a human being. One of our big problems is that 75% of our kids grow up with only one parent at home. The men are not there. And this puts an enormous burden, particularly on the shoulders of black single mothers. So I would say to, to young people, get an education, try and get a job, develop really good relationships, get a life. <laughs> what would you say to the American, the, uh, us as Americans, this generation? <clears throat> I think that uh, you should should understand that you have one of the really great societies in history. I think your uh, society has done more to promote freedom in the world than any other country, society in history. Uh, your institutions are, are admirable. You had wonderful founding fathers. Uh, you have a great constitution. I would say abide by those values, re reaffirm them, don't lose faith or 
in the things that have made your country great. Which means we have to educate ourselves on those things. It's not enough to get by. <clears throat> yes, I think that's good advice. Um, I'm curious. Uh, we've heard a lot. I mean, and this is an incredible range that mm. you have um, to really help us understand more accurately where we are and what the context is that we're operating in. What did you guys hear? Did anybody want to say what you've heard that struck you or had meaning for you? Go ahead. Um, what really struck me was when you talked about how the mistakes you made were when you didn't speak up. Mm -hmm. um, that really um, resonated with me. Thank you. Cece? Um, twice you said, whatever you do, do it well and be flexible and take opportunities. Mm -hmm. And I think that's advice that we can all take as we go forward in our life. I like what you said about when you're saying um, that you strive to be interested in whatever you did and, the, and that helped you like to just do well in what you did. It was really nice. I really appreciated that you took the time to teach us about the socioeconomics of South Africa and all of the issues and talk and you spoke about the progress. I I really appreciated that and I think we all did. Um, yeah. As Sophia said on the socioeconomics, you know, you walk into this room and you take a look at that and it's a very complicated uh, thing that, you know, it's pretty hard to understand <laughs> off the bat and I appreciate how you we're able to simplify that into, you know, relatively speaking, layman's terms. I just kind of want to thank you for coming here to take your time to speak with us. I really appreciate it, and I know everyone else in this room really does too. Absolutely. Look, the, the, the reality is that, you think about it, if you're not providing a service to somebody, what is your purpose? <laughs> and the, uh, the other thing too is that uh, providing a service is one of the most satisfying things that you can do. If you provide a good service to somebody, you feel really good about it. They feel good about it. Your organization looks good. So, so being, being a servant uh, is often regarded as being as almost a perjurative Term. But in fact, being a servant is the highest role that you can play. So, thank you very much for taking the time. To Great, come pleasure. Yes. Great yeah. pleasure. Great yeah. pleasure. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah.